Howdy, folks. Sorry, at long last is the moment you've been waiting for. Good evening, and welcome to the Rare Book Room. My name is Nick, and I help direct the events here at Strand Bookstore. For a little bit of history, the Strand was founded in 1927 over on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled until after over 92 years. We are the sole survivor of that conglomo of bookstores, still run by the Bass family and still housing new and used books. Tonight, I'm very excited to welcome back two of today's best writers to discuss one of the greatest American novels of all time. Brought together by the Library of America's brand new collection, March Sisters, on life, death, and little women, Kate Bullock and Carmen Maria Machado, along with Jenny Zhang and Jane Smiley, contributors who will not be here this evening, unfortunately, look back at Louisa May Alcott's classic novel on the occasion of its 150th anniversary. Taking as their subjects, Meg and Beth, Respectively, Kate and Carmen excavate the trials and tribulations that shape the characters, their creation in Alcott's mind, and their significance in their own lives. Kate is the author of the best-selling Spinster, Making a Life of One's Own, which was named a New York Times Notable Book of 2015. That is the end of my sentence. Carmen is the author of Her Body and Other Parties and the upcoming In the Dream House, finalist for the National Book Award and contributes to The New Yorker, Tin House, and elsewhere. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming them to The Strand. everyone. Hi. It's so good to see all your shining faces. This on the is really fun. <laughs> I'm, seeing so, I'm seeing so many people that I'm happy to see. Uh, I was already on and I just turned it off. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay, great. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> okay. So we are going to be talking about writing our essays, reading you some excerpts, and then taking questions. Um, so, I, and I am, I am starting. Um, so my essay, um, A Dear and Nothing Else, which is about Beth March, um, uh, I, wrote it, I wrote it last year while I was working on this other project that was very sad. And so I kept sort of cutting back and forth between this like very difficult, my memoir, which I was writing and it was very hard. And then I was like, uh, to, 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 to lighten the mood, to make me feel less like I wanted to die, I'm gonna write an essay about this really incredibly ill character who dies this very tragic death. Um, and somehow it felt lighter and better than what I was doing with the rest of my time. Um, and it's funny because when I was initially asked to do this project, they said, you want to do Beth? And I was like, Beth? I was like, what, not Joe, really? <laughs> um, because I feel like when you're a certain kind of young woman, Joe is just the best, right? And everybody else, you know. Whatever. Um, but then once I started really reading, uh, when I reread the book, which I hadn't read since I was a small child, and when I began to really read up about Lizzie Alcott, who um, Beth is based on, um, I realized that I actually had a lot more kinship with her than I had realized, and it made me really sad. So, um, so yeah. And then I and then I wrote the essay. I'm going to talk a little bit about personality quizzes, and. Body horror, okay. Oh, and I should add that sort of as the framing of, I'm not really probably gonna read much of it, but sort of the framing of the essay is also, I talk about Beth, I talk about my own childhood as like a sick kid who had like some weird medical stuff and I was like a very bad patient. Um, and so there's sort of like, that's sort of the frame of the essay. Revisiting Little Women's Little Women as an adult was both strange and surprising. Despite my powerful abiding aversion to Amy, her burning of Joe's manuscript created a deep, lifelong terror of losing the only copy of one's words. I have softened toward her for a smit I have softened toward her a smidge, if only because she changes the most over the course of the novel while also remaining utterly herself. Though I still firmly believe that the otherwise very morally pure and instructive plot 
plot point of Joe rescuing her when she falls through thin ice and then reflecting guiltily on her own anger would have been far more interesting and satisfying if Joe had simply watched her go under. I am unnerved. Joe should have let Amy drown. I am unnerved as an adult to identify with Meg the most, that is to say, a boring homebody who wants fine things. If only I had a silk. Joe, of course, is a delight insofar as she is a writer of infinite invention and imagination who frequently loses herself in her work, but she reads as a bit more tedious, a bit more Mary Sue, perhaps, to my present self. And then I have a footnote down here, which I, like, I would like to read. Far more interesting, when, and what went over my head as a kid, was Joe's delightful gender fuckery, her queerness. Quote, I'm the man of the family now that Papa is away, she says in an early chapter, and continues to assert her own masculinity throughout the novel. As a, chi- as a child, I thought that Laurie, prone to Byronic fits of gloom, a glorious human bo- boy who frolicked and flirted, grew dandified, aquatic, sentimental, and gymnastic, and hinted darkly at one all-absorbing passion was Joe's one true love and was, of course, heartbroken when she rejected him. As an adult, recognizing Joe for what she was, I realized that my heartbreak was an unsettling precognition that they would have made a mercurial but otherwise fine gay couple. (laughs) But Beth, what was there to say about Beth? Reading the book with her death in mind was singularly odd. I waited for it like a guillotine. I remembered so little about her that I was surprised to discover that she's alive for a full 80% of the novel. (laughs) If you'd asked me before the reread, I would have sworn she died somewhere in the middle, maybe even earlier. Little Women was an early example of character archetypes as as character archetypes as clearly mappable. Cosmo, or sorry, bleh. Little Women was an early example of character archetypes as clearly mappable Cosmo magazine style personality types, a prototype for Harry Potter's houses or his d- Dark Materials daemons. Are you Joe, the Gryffindor of the group, brave who suffers no fools while also being slightly insufferable herself, thinks highly, quite highly of herself? the author insert character that everybody wants to be, or maybe you're Amy, power hungry, silly, vain, Slytherin, obviously, Joe's main antagonist within the family, perhaps Meg, Ravenclaw, dull in personality, but smart and interested in the finer things in life, or maybe heavens forfend, your Hufflepuff Beth, pure and loyal, dowdy and dead. It is a curious thing, the archetype, a feature of some genres, fairy tale, satire, and a taboo in others, realism. When they appear when they are not expected, they feel curiously incomplete, as if a single character has been lopped apart. But in real life, we love to be shoved into those boxes. We love horoscopes and Myers-Briggs and hometown cliches and other clannish taxidermies. This instinct to put things into an easily identifiable category starts young. It is literally a part of childhood development. Even the aggravating focus on girl things and boy things is a combination of unnecessarily adult obsession with gender binaries and a child's natural instincts to make things fit in one place or another. This preoccupation lasts into adulthood for all of the obvious reasons, the desire to be part of a group, comfort in the idea that there are others like you, the latent belief that your personality is, in a way, outside of your control. It also provides a soothing lack of wholeness, the idea that the puzzle piece of us is meant to link up with the puzzle pieces of other people. Quote, Beth is my conscience, Joe tells Lori. It is also a way of defining who we are not. I am not a Slytherin. I am the opposite of a Taurus. I'd rather die than be a Meg. Even though, like, astrological, sorry. <laughs> Even though, like, astrological signs and Hogwarts houses, the qualities, these qualities only add together to create one, maybe one and a half distinct people, and yet we crave their guidance. We gain much by blunting ourselves against the archetype's hard surface. Beth is the too pure for this world archetype made manifest. She is beautiful but sexless, artistic but very embarrassed about it, and it's good that she doesn't have any kind of ambition because she's going to die. And I don't mean that in a we're all mortal sense. She is created with her premature death already seared into her timeline, a fact of her personality. She is born a ghost. In the first chapter of Little Women, when Louisa May Alcott is doling out archetypes to the siblings, Beth asks, if Joe is a tomboy and Amy is a goose, then what am I, please? You're a deer, Meg answers, and nothing else. 
People who have studied anything about Little Women know the novel is based roughly on Louisa's family, a clan of thinkers, artists, and transcendentalists who rubbed elbows with the premier minds of their time, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, Margaret Fuller. Beth is no exception. She is based on Alcott's second youngest sister, Lizzie. Lizzie, like Beth, was stricken with scarlet fever. During this initial illness, her family, vegans and believed in alternative medicine, did not send for a doctor. Like Beth, she recovered from her illness, but her heart weakened, never regained full health. Like Beth, she died tragically young, though not quite as young as her literary counterpart. But while Beth bore her suffering gladly, with unconscionable cheer and resolution, Lizzie was enraged at the fact of her own mortality. In Little Women, writes Alcott's biographer Susan Cheever, Beth has a quiet, dignified death, a fictional death. Although young Lizzie Alcott was a graceful, quiet woman, she was not so lucky. A 22-year-old whose disease had wasted her body so that she looked like a middle-aged woman, she lashed out at her family and her fate with an anger that she had never before expressed. Louisa and, the, Louisa and the others caring for Lizzie plied her with morphine, ether, and opium, though eventually they lost any effect they could have on her. The pain, writes Cheever in American Bloomsbury, seemed to drive her mad. Even on large doses of opium, Lizzie attacked her sisters and then asked to be left in peace. By the end, the fight had gone out of her body. The final words her family could understand were, Well now, mother, I go, I go. How beautiful everything is tonight. And though she kept up a little inaudible monologue for a short while after that. When she passed, both Louisa and Abba reported seeing a light mist rise from the body, from her body and float up and vanish into the air. Lizzie was buried in Sleepy Hollow Cemetery in Concord, Massachusetts, on a patch of land she'd chosen before her death. Thoreau and Emerson served as pallbearers. Quote, Emerson told the officiating minister, who did not know the family well, that Lizzie was a good, unselfish, patient child who made friends even in death, John Madison wrote in Eden's Outcast. Everyone seemed to forget that they were not bearing a child, but a woman of 22. Thank you. Hey, I keep going. To keep going? Oh. <laughs> um, sure, I will keep talking about Beth. I will keep doing it. <laughs> Little Women is positively lousy with premonitions of Beth's death. Beth is, in turn, forced to stare down her beloved canary Pip, quote, who lay dead in the cage with his little claws pathetically extended as if imploring the, for fo the, wa imploring the food for one of which he had died, end quote, and to bury him in a domino box and to cradle a dead baby, a baby dead from the same scarlet fever that would years later kill her. Little cruelties and ironies abound throughout the entire book, everything from strawberries in winter to castles in the sky to animal metaphors seem like odd jokes or else Alcott's subconscious planting her grief on every page. But grief is otherwise a strange and flattening thing. Beneath its weight, Beth becomes faultless, angelic, positively uncomplicated. Her ambitions are not squashed by her infirmity because she has none. Her only imperfection, shyness, seems like a humble brag, like a job candidate telling an interviewer that her primary flaw is working too hard. There is also an extended sequence in which we learn that Beth cares for a group of invalid dolls abandoned by her more discerning siblings. She cares for them the way that she will be cared for one day. And this is a quote from the book, from Little Women. Not one whole or handsome one among them, all were outcast till, Belle till Beth took them in. She cherished them all more tenderly for that very reason and set up a hospital for infirm dolls. No pins were ever stuck to their cotton vitals, no harsh words or blows ever given them, no neglect ever saddened the heart of the most repulsive, but all were fed and clothed, nursed and caressed, with an affection which never failed. If anyone had known the care lavished on her dolls, I think it would have touched their hearts, even whilst they laughed. Reading, th reading it, I thought about the hospital I created with my friend Margaret for our American Girl dolls when we were, when we were kids. 
With the assistance of her mother, who was a nurse, we constructed EKG machines from paper and cardboard and IVs with Ziploc bags and food dye and diagnosed our dolls, hers a Molly and mine a girl of today I called Sarah after the protagonist in A Little Princess with terrible diseases that needed immediate attention. It was as frenetic a scene as Beth's was docile, active, whirring care. We created a large and dramatic backstory in which we were sisters and our dolls, our daughters, who had matching, undiagnosed ailments. I drew stitches on my doll's stomach and my mother almost had a heart attack. She asked me if I knew how expensive the doll had been, and I told her that mysterious illnesses did not make such judgments. She was really pissed about that. Um, there we go. All right, one more section. Sound good? Okay. Um, so earlier in the essay, I talk about Bronson Alcott, who is the, the parents of Louisa May Alcott and her sisters. Within minutes of Lizzie's birth, Bronson Alcott began writing what, was, what would eventually be a 500-page unpublished manuscript, Psyche, or The Breath of Childhood. Uh, Bronson, ga incidentally, Bronson gave the manuscript to his friend Ralph Waldo Emerson for his feedback. Emerson reluctantly informed him that the majority of the project was unpublishable and Bronson eventually abandoned it. So it took me a while to track it down because he was real upset about it. Um, the book was a combination of Bronson's meditations on the growth of the growth of the spirit and his observations about childhood development. As Lizzie was an infant, she became the focus of the project, so much so the family called her psyche for a time. In its pages, Bronson Alcott sought to understand the mysterious alchemy occurring in his youngest daughter's mind. Quote, I took her in my arms today that I might perchance tempt forth the indwelling vision and fix for her for a moment on my own face, he wrote. She fixed her eyes deep on me with an intensity of vision. Yet a moment of endeavor and the free will was, dis was disenthralled from the instinctive and the vision was given of her living individual being. Then came the smile, the sense, the upfilling joy from the spirit, which the spirit's life from the fount of which from which cometh all love, all bliss, all peace and repose that bloweth into the ample heart of man. He was unbearable, as you can tell. <laughs> He was also quite relieved at Lizzie's relative, relative agreeableness, a trait that apparently had not manifested in his other children. <laughs> she, quote, cries but, sel cries but seldom, often smiles, he wrote, and the prevailing temper of her spirit seems that, seems that of repose, deep, still, sustained peace. She is quiet, self-satisfied, self-subsistent. On the ocean of the infinite doth her spirit calmly lie as a simple wavelet, unagitated by distant storms. Bronson did not write this way about his other children. He recorded Anna, uh, who Meg is based on, yes? No. Yeah. I can't right? Yeah, Anna's, Anna's Meg, I think. He recorded Anna calling for him after a terrifying and vivid dream. He noted his desire to take Louisa into the country so that he might access, quote, the true history of her spirit, her range of thought, her vocabulary, her prevailing tendencies, whether good or evil. May, the daughter after whom Amy would be modeled and Little Women had yet to be born when Psyche was written. But as for Lizzie, her position was far more elemental. This morning I saw Elizabeth, he wrote, while her mother was preparing her for the day. The forms and motions of an infant, how beautiful, how open were her arms. How confidingly did she stretch them forth toward that nature, on now which she relies for that sustaining influence, which shall supply the waste and exhaustion of the animal functions of the flesh. Jesus Christ. <laughs> into which she has just entered. Her position is in and of itself a prayer of aspiration, her breath of life and inscription. She hath faith, she hath love, she is bent heavenward. She turn, turneth toward the source of the spirit by the sense that worketh deep within her, even as a sunflower toward the radiant light on which it feeds. Here we can see Bronson's projections onto Lizzie, the way he views her as having a plant-like passivity, her actions something akin to a Venus flytrap closing over its prey, pure instinct. I am being unfair to Bronson. Of course he thought that Elizabeth was a creature on which he could project his own mind. We adore imbuing infants, like dogs, with emotions and reactions that make sense to us. He feels guilty. She's having an existential crisis. Plus, the other girls were older, already exhibiting their, exhibiting their own personalities. Lizzie was an exquisite tabula rasa, an object with no obje obvious subjectivity. Psyche, Bronson wrote, prefers summertime. Um, 
I too was a Joe. Uh, when I was a kid, <laughs> and I thought that it would be interesting to look at Meg, who I'd never, I couldn't remember anything about her. You know, she was so boring and good and, uh, you know, just interested in clothes and getting married, and I, I, I couldn't remember anything about her. So I thought it would be interesting to look at her as a way of looking at how Louisa May Alcott, who never married, thought about marriage, since Meg's the one who gets married off. And so, so that was my agenda going into writing this essay, was I'll, I'll reread the book and be looking at how Alcott treats Meg as a woman who's obsessed with getting married, and that's the, the whole goal of her life. Um, and then something happened, which is I realized, uh, in fact, what I was most interested in was Meg's relationship to her own vanity and clothing. So I had been, and I still am a lot, but I've been thinking a lot about what Virginia Woolf calls frock consciousness. So I'll get into that when I'm reading from it. But like, so in short, I've always had a very vexed and complicated relationship to clothing and getting dressed. It's uh, I sort of love it and hate it at the same time. And I you know I got teased a lot as a kid for my fashion sense. Maybe that's part. I don't know. I just there's um. It's complicated being a woman, I think, and especially dressing to be in public to be a woman and all of it. And, and the, the class confusion, too. So, you know, coming from, I grew up in a small town in uh, Massachusetts and coming to New York City and all of the kind of minefields that presented of, of, of moving in different social circles and what to wear <laughs> to any of it. Um, so, so Meg is, um, I, wait, do I have it? Um, well, it, one of her first lines is they're invited somewhere, and she says, whatever shall we wear? <laughs> and I was like, right, I know. What shall we wear? So, <laughs> so, so one way I, I, I kind of dove back into my nine-year-old self, which is when I'd first read the book, was as I, as I was rereading, I could see very clearly in my mind's eye the cover of the book report that I'd written about Little Women in fourth grade. And I, so I went home to Massachusetts and found it, and we've included it in the book. <laughs> Can you, oh my god, like just my nine-year-old self, because I, I was so proud of this. I worked really, really hard on the cover. Um, it's in color in, in real life. And so looking at the cover, I learned a lot about who I was at that time, at age nine, uh, and what I was thinking about. So my memory is of myself as a Joe, which was correct. So there's this... Um, uh, Okay, so I'll start reading bits and bobs, and then I'll talk and read as I go. That's how I'm going to do it. These, our essays are very long, so that's why we're, we're doing this. Um, the word tomboy fits, but imperfectly. It's not that I wanted to be a boy or do only boyish things, but rather that my liberal-minded parents allowed me to inhabit a genderless space, and I looked the part. That summer, on my ninth birthday, in his consciously unsentimental family diary, my father described me as being of average height, slim but not skinny, long light brown hair, sort of lank, which is usually messy and tends to need washing. For some reason, she resists taking baths, horrible teeth. School photos show I didn't yet know to be embarrassed of my comically pronounced overbite and snaggletooth grin. Like Alcott herself, I enjoyed challenging the boys to foot races. And so, um, so then another memory emerged, which was that for Halloween, well, two things. One, that after reading Little Women, I started obsessively drawing old-fashioned ladies in hoop skirts. And, um, and so it was a kind of odd practice, given that I'd never been interested in that stuff. And then I also decided that for Halloween, I wanted to be an old-fashioned lady. So <laughs> we, we cobbled a costume together. And um, I have a snapshot from that night, this Halloween night, framed on the mantle. Four children standing on a doorstep, my little brother a tiny vampire, all of them looking everywhere but at the camera, while I, the oldest, regal in my finery, the Meg of this ragtag gang, gaze steadily at the lens, my expression serene, even confident. My mouth is clamped closed to conceal my crooked teeth. 
So what I realized was that there was a lot going on inside my little Kate head at age nine about what it meant to be a girl. And I, so, I, when fourth, so I read Little Women over the summer, and then when I got to fourth grade, I discovered that I was one of the first girls to have grown boobs. And I was so embarrassed <laughs> to have breasts. It was just like, what are these things? I wore two heavy wool sweaters all year so that nobody could see them. I just, I really hated this idea of becoming a grown up and becoming a woman and being sexualized it made me very uncomfortable. Uh, and so Meg became this, this way of thinking about, you know, she was 16, she was past the changes of puberty, she was sort of glamorous and pretty, you know, she didn't look like this snaggletooth weirdo that I looked like. And so she was a kind of older sister figure in terms of being someone a little older. I could imagine what what teenage, you know, what adolescence could look like. Maybe it wasn't as bad as it seemed. Um, so anyway, I, I go on through middle and high school being just all vexed by my acne and my boobs. <laughs> And, um, and just embarrassed always. Um, it, it probably, oh wait, where's this? Um, okay, so now I'll start reading again. What, what is it that happens between a woman and her clothes? Virginia Woolf coined the term frock consciousness to describe this relationship or frequency or vibration, whatever it is, in a 1925 diary entry. Mrs. Dalloway, had Mrs. Dalloway had just been published, and she'd been sitting for a photograph in Vogue. My present reflection, she wrote, is that people have any number of states of consciousness, and I should like to investigate the party consciousness, the frock consciousness, and etc. These states are very difficult. I'm always coming back to it. Still, I cannot get at what they mean. She wanted to unpack the simultaneous outward-inward nature of clothing, the fact that what we wear is a visible tactile membrane between our private and public selves that expresses who we think we are or who we wish to be, while also affecting how others feel about us, a curious feedback loop of self-perception. In a wonderful essay about Wolf's inquiry, inquiry, the scholar Rosemary Hill points out that Clarissa Dalloway's favorite dress is both distinctive and yet suitable, which is, she writes, what many women want from their clothes, to stand out and to fit in to the same degree at the same time. When I read that line, I silently applauded its accuracy. Is that not exactly what I'm trying to accomplish nearly every time I dress to leave the house? So I want to be invisible, but I want to also look like myself and not like everybody else. Is basically what I'm always trying to do. Um, so it probably took me longer than it should have to understand that biology is only one part of the story. Virginia Woolf writes, say what, oh, say, this is a quote. Say what your beauty means to you or your plainness, and what is your relation to the ever-changing and turning world of gloves and shoes and stuffs, Woolf writes in a room of one's own. Once upon a time, I took stock of my plainness and I accepted it, or so I thought. Not until my early 30s did I reckon with the world of gloves and shoes and stuffs. It wasn't my first dress fiasco, but it was my first of any significance. At 33, I'd taken an, edit an editorial position at a glossy lifestyle magazine in Times Square, where I learned that whatever attractiveness I possessed could be improved upon. My blotchy skin and acne scars could be concealed with foundation. My lank locks enlivened with a good and expensive haircut. My short legs lengthened with high heels. The discovery that it was within my power to enhance my appearance was when things got confusing. Until then, I bought my clothes on sale or second hand, proud of my thrift, proud even to, cult to cultivate desires for garments based mainly on their affordability. My wardrobe was a collection of misfits and underdogs that had, thanks to my munificence, found a home, or so went my pretense. Now that I was making real money, I could walk into a shop, fall in love with a dress or a sweater on its merits alone, and suddenly own it just like that. I'd assumed such freedom would bring me pleasure. I hadn't anticipated the complications. 
For one, I couldn't let go of the internal agitation it caused me to spend money. A small tightening in the chest, almost a shortness of breath, followed by a massive distrust in my purchase and an overwhelming urge to return it. A Massachusetts Puritan to the bone. Worse, wearing something that fit the way that it was intended to, or was a color that flattered my complexion, or any number of details that make a garment suit a woman and enhance her attractiveness made me deeply uncomfortable, as if I were trying to be something that I wasn't. At the magazine, someone came up with the phrase frock shock to describe those mornings one or the other of us was late to work because we'd been standing paralyzed in front of our closets, incapable of choosing what to wear. It was a ridiculous problem to have, but the fact that I wasn't alone in it was a true comfort. When I reread Little Women, I discover that, um, that Meg had had an experience, a lot like an experience I had had in my 30s about a dress. Um, so, Meg, so, okay, so it's, uh, so Meg's most significant chapter is not her marriage, which is what I had assumed, but uh, about the time she goes off to spend a fortnight of novelty and pleasure with her rich friend, Annie Moffat. Meg goes to Vanity Fair is Meg's only departure from the bosom of, f bosom of family. Unlike Amy and Joe, who both were given the chance to demonstrate Alcott's belief that young women should live for a significant period of time on their own to discover themselves, Meg is granted only these two weeks. Fittingly, the chapter title refers to the fair held in the frivolous town of Vanity in John Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress, a favorite text of both the March and Alcott families. Packing her humble frocks for the trip, Meg says impatiently, I wonder if I shall ever be happy enough to have real lace on my clothes and bows on my caps. The problem of vanity isn't entirely beyond the comprehension of a nine-year-old girl. I knew it well from Snow White's plight. Were her stepmother less vain, she wouldn't have tried to get her killed. Class disparity was equally legible. I understood that Cinderella was poor, Prince, Ram Prince Charming was rich, and, the right, and that the right dress would blind him to this discrepancy, the economic aspect of fro frock consciousness exemplified, that if all went well, she'd marry him, thus becoming rich herself, and that being rich was perforce a good thing, possibly the best thing, better than being good, because clearly kindness alone wasn't doing Cinderella any favors. Nor did I understand the shame Meg felt over having only two dresses, so new was I at comparing myself with others. And so I thrilled at the chapter's apogee when the kindly Belle Moffat, Annie's sister, offers to loan Meg her sweet blue silk to wear to their fancy final fete. The evening of, Belle and her maid crimp and curl Meg's hair, shower her, shower her with some fragrant powder, redden her lips with Coraline salve. After that, Meg draws the line, no rouge, and lace her into the tight-fitting, low-cut sky blue gown. A full set of jewelry, a cluster of rosebuds, and high-heeled blue silk boots from France complete the effect. Everyone deems her a little beauty. Meg had always known herself to be pretty, but now when she looks in the mirror, she sees something else, a fashion plate, as she later confesses to her mother. For a long several minutes, heart beating, feeling as if her fun had really begun at last, she stands alone, admiring her transformation. This is where Alcott twists the knife. She compares Meg to the jackdaw in Aesop's f famous fable, who, after envying the peacock's splendid feathers, sticks a bunch of their borrowed plumes into his own plain black tail, then struts among his fellow jackdaws, fooling nobody but himself. As if heeding Alcott's warning, here Meg pauses for a moment, afraid to go down to the party, so queer and stiff and half-dressed. But quickly enough, she summons her courage and sails into the drawing room, where she successfully passes as a fine lady and enjoys herself, until she looks across the room and sees Laurie. 
staring at her with undisguised surprise and disapproval also. Suddenly self-conscious again, wishing she'd worn her old dress after all, she nonetheless crosses the room to greet him. He refuses to meet her eyes. He admits that he's quite afraid of her, looking so grown up and unlike yourself, then adds that he doesn't like fuss and feathers. So she gets, she's hurt and she tells him off and, um, and the night goes on. It's a, a capital, it's a captiv captivating moment of double consciousness. For the first time, Meg has looked in the mirror and seen how gorgeous she can be, how very like the illustrated fashion plates she's heretofore admired in magazines. The sumptuous clothes are both costume and passport. Passing as someone she's not, she's free to assume behaviors she never would otherwise. And yet, having at last achieved her long-held desire for lace and bows on her clothes, albeit borrowed, she spends her night of glory not in unmitigated triumph like Cinderella, but demeaned like the jackdaw, careening between compliments and insults, excitement and embarrassment, wholly at the mercy of how others experience her manifest beauty, and ultimately, ultimately deprived of her own pleasure. Did Alcott intend Meg's vanity as punishment for not having pursuits of her own, other than to someday marry and have a nice house and clothes? Or was she lobbing a warning about the pernicious underside of upward mobility? Of the four sisters, only Meg is old enough to be off navigating fraught social spaces. In Alcott's time, if a young woman from a poor family appreciated nice things, the only way to get them was through marriage or prostitution. Unsurprisingly, perhaps, it was the barely middle-class Alcott, not the upper-class Wolf, who recognized this economic aspect of frock consciousness. Maybe Alcott wasn't punishing Meg so much as admitting that, lacking the freedoms granted to men, many women rely on other means to express their more limited range of powers. It was her hope that Meg, and all the rest of us, would find a better way. Some memories progress in stages instead of appearing all at once. We can't always know what is happening as it happens. If we're lucky, we remember later, at which point our, rec our recollection is informed by the knowledge we've since accrued. It's not that we misremember necessarily, or not always. It's that in the act of remembering, we can't help seeing the event in a way that we couldn't when it first took place. It's a useful process, a retrospective wisdom. Is it possible to say that during my dress fiasco, I had a cellular memory of Meg's shame over the silk blue dress? I don't know, it feels too romantic. And yet I do believe that books seep into us and change us in ways we can't keep track of. At nine, I breezed through Meg's fortnight with the Moffats, only taking in the elements that made quick sense to me. Then, many years later, I experienced the same event in my own life without remembering hers. After that, more years passed until I finally read Re Little Women again and revisited Meg's frock, shot on, frock shock on the page, but this time through the scrim of my own memory, as if overlaying Alcott's words was a sheet of tracing paper on which I'd skept my own ep sketched my own episode. This time around, it was a dual experience, Meg's and my own. The morning, so, so what happened was my, I, at this bossy mag, glossy magazine, my boss, who didn't like me, and would say, Bullock, you're creeping me out being so quiet <laughs> in meetings. Um, what's, you know, and I, ugh, I it, it was bad. Um, so, but, and she would call in clothes from designers. So there's this party, I get invited by this guy I'm involved with. It's, it's complicated. You learn all about it uh, in the book. Um, so, uh, the, so I'm really anxious to go to this party. And I, of course, don't have anything to wear. I'm going to wear what I wore to my brother's rehearsal dinner, like the summer before or something. The morning of my boss's party, I arrived at work to find a garment bag laid across my desk. It was customary for Claire to call in clothes from designers to wear to big events. And at first, I assumed this had something to do with that, that they were hers, somehow misplaced. But when I looked inside, I saw two dresses in my size. I ran to her office to thank her, but she wasn't there, so I ran instead to the bathroom to try them on. The first was very me, something I would have picked out myself. Prim, retro, it was made of a slightly stiff fabric, almost a brocade, woven with big gold and silver triangles. 
The bodice had a high crew neck and short sleeves, and the skirt was an A-line that hit at the knee. Or it was supposed to. To look right, it would need to be taken up several inches. The other was made of a black silk jersey that slunk in my hands like a cat. Once on, it clung to every curve I had. The neckline plunged to my sternum. I stared at myself in the mirror. I had never seen myself like this, so unapologetically sexy in the contemporary sense, like an actress on the red carpet. I looked and looked. I couldn't take my eyes off myself. At that moment, the fashion editor walked into the bathroom, unsurprised. She'd been the one to guess my size and what styles might suit me. Looks good, she said, glancing at me, before disappearing into a stall. But you'll definitely need some bronzer on your chest. I took in my very white, freckled decolletage and knew it didn't matter that I'd never wear this dress anyhow. At 5 p.m., I raced back to Brooklyn and straight to the tailor to beg her to hem the gold and silver dress in an hour. She kindly agreed. At home, I showered and blew my hair dry, twisted it into a loose chignon, how do we say that word? Applied makeup, then, get, then got down on my hands and knees and went hunting through my closet for the black heels I'd worn to my brother's wedding. After exactly 60 minutes had passed, I dashed out to the tailors, retrieved the gold and silver dress, ran back home, put it on, touched up my lipstick one more time, grabbed the, nor grabbed the doorknob, and paused. Without letting myself think, I turned around, pulled off the gold and silver dress, stepped into the black one, zipped it up, grabbed the doorknob again, and left my apartment. By the time I reached the corner to find a cab, I could barely contain my anxiety. What a fool I'd been. How could I possibly go out in public looking like this, so attention-grabbing, so conspicuous, so one-note sexy? I looked ridiculous. I had to go back and change. Just then, a taxi pulled up. Heart pounding, I dove inside, gave the driver the address on the far west side of Manhattan, and telephoned my brother. When he picked up, I was nearly hyperventilating. What is it? What is it? He kept asking. I had no idea how to explain. I'm on my way to a party, I said to allay his alarm, though saying the words out loud only made my situation more inexplicable. I was on my way to a party wearing a designer dress, in a cab no less, and I couldn't breathe. My brother, bless him stayed on the line until I'd arrived. I paid the fare, stepped out of the cab. The venue overlooked the Hudson River, orange with the lowering sun. The walls resembled glass waves. I could see inside to the party already in full swing. I wished for a coat, an excuse to visit the cloakroom, a buffer between apprehending the party and becoming subsumed. Instead, I pulled open the glass door and walked straight in, got a drink, found Noah in the crowd. He wore dark jeans, a charcoal suit jacket, a white dress, black shoes. He looked me up and down. He didn't look at me so much as look through me. His expression was one of mild disdain. At last, he spoke. Well, well, he said archly, cocking an eyebrow. If someone didn't take cocktail attire to the next level. I froze, smothered in shame. I had tried to be something I wasn't, and I hadn't succeeded. I would never be pretty. I would never fit in. I would always be the scrawny girl with buck teeth and lank hair, the misfit with odd thoughts and the wrong clothes. He would never love me the way I wanted. I can, I'll end there. I'm now remembering when I reread Little Women, the rage I felt at Lori for telling Meg that. Like, I, I was like, fuck him forever. Like, that, he is the worst. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what a jerk. Yeah. All right, so we're ready for questions. If anyone has, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Hi, um, I actually have two questions, if that's okay. So maybe Kate and Carmen could each answer one. Um, but firstly, in either of your opinions, I was just wondering what should young women who are reading Little Woman today for the first time be taking away from the book and how, in a modern context, should we interpret the message or like the running theme through the book of young girls knowing their place in society? 
Um, and then secondly, I think that it takes a truly great book to transcend so many generations and be able to survive for 150 years at this point. Um, and so I was also then wondering, like, what do you think it is about Little Women that makes it so universal that it can resonate so profoundly with nine-year-olds and even like the grandparents and great-grandparents of those nine-year-olds who are reading it at all different periods in their lifetimes? Great questions. Do you have anything to say? Do you want me to start? Yeah, I mean, I think it was interesting when I was rereading it because it, there's a lot of it's you know there's a lot of sort of like didactic sort of parts of the book, like a lot of sort of very preachy sort of moral lessons that are being imposed, much of which I absolutely do not uh, agree with in any way. Um, and I was kind of like, all right, come on, uh, come on, Alcott, <laughs> like, what's the deal? Um, but then I kept thinking about how when I read it as a kid, I was obsessed with it. And I read it many times over and like had just internalized so much of it. And I think that ultimately there's something about like even if there is this sort of like weird sort of moral, like, like sort of dated like moral code that's like attached to a lot of the story, um, there's something about seeing young women like at the center of their own stories that like is really powerful. Um, I mean, I think that Joe also, like, Joe in particular, like, appeals to, like, every, like, smart girl who, like, in any way feels like they sort of don't quite fit in femininity, which is, like, I feel like a lot of women, um, like, sees himself in Joe, and, like, Joe's become just this, this iconic figure. I think that's why she's lasted for so long. I think more than any of the others. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and, and partly about like what can we take out of it now and also speaking to its enduringness um, is that this is a book that's grappling with modernity. So, you know, Baudelaire coined the term modernity in like 1936 or something, or maybe it's 46. But anyway, it was the Industrial Revolution. We had urban areas expanding for the first time. And so the, the stuff that people were dealing with then is exactly what we're dealing with now in terms of work and money and class as I was focusing on here. So we tend to think of the mid 1800s as being very, very far away. And they certainly look like they have nothing to do with us with their hoop skirts and their bonnets. But in fact, there was a, there was a modern consciousness coming into being. And her, the, 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 the late feminist historian Gerda Lerner, uh, when she set out to write the book, The Creation of Patriarchy, no, 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 no. She wanted to write the book she wanted to write about why did it take so long for feminism to happen? What, what's, um, why? And then to, when she started addressing that question, she realized that, well, to understand why, she had to understand patriarchy and how it came to be. So she wrote the creation of patriarchy instead. And then she wrote the creation of feminist consciousness. And Alcott's, it's interesting, you know, people weren't using the word feminist at this time. The, She's obviously a feminist, and, and really it's it, what, it, what her sensibility boils down to, I think of, is just feminism is common sense. That if you're a smart woman, and if you were lucky enough, to, you know, Alcott was crazy, but he at least wanted her educated. And so if you were getting to read and write and think and encounter ideas at a time when other people weren't, you were able to say, like, this is bullshit, and stuff should be different for women. So, I, and I, I really personally like reading that during that time period, women encountering those ideas because it's it's because it's before it all gets calcified with you know th the political language and identity politics of today you know just like the way people could encounter these ideas fresh because they were fresh at the time and and that's so that that sensibility is what part of what makes the, the book feel contemporary even though it has an old-fashioned setting yeah I also feel like there was a point in my life when I started reading older books I mean Little Women was a book that I don't think I sort of registered it because I first read it when I was like six or seven like I was really young and I don't think I had like had made that distinction between like old books and new books like I knew that they were like old-fashioned ladies you know but they that was about all I sort of knew and then years later I remember like starting to read like older books like books that were published like before my before I was born and then like before my parents were born or like maybe the last century and being like people could be funny in the past <laughs> like turns out we didn't like invent humor but like it was just weird because it's like that it didn't even occur to me like I was like you know the old times they were like very stodgy and not funny at all 
and you know probably never even had sex or anything and like you know modern times like invented all this great stuff um but yeah but there is something really i feel like when you read it like it's so it is fresh in a lot of ways and it feels very real and, and is actually also very funny like there are a lot of funny parts where i laughed where it, it yeah. intentionally funny like where it was clear like outcut was I don't know. Yeah. So. And, and there's also, as, as Carmen was speaking to in her piece, the uh, matter of archetypes. So with these four sisters, we're able to read ourselves into all of them and against them. And it's so it's like the precursor to Sex in the City in girls, you know, having four different types embody all aspects of a straight female experience. Well, that it just about makes time. So can we have a round of applause for Kate and Carmen, please? <laughs>